So here we are. This is what Rome is controlling around 150 to 146 BC. They control everything in the yellow and the orange area except down here. They don't have Carthage yet. That's why I drew these lines here. And we just looked at uh, the last video, the conquest of Greece and the fourth and final Macedonia War, which went from 150 BC to 146 BC. And I just wanted to wrap up the conquest of Greece because we're going to be looking at a war going on in Spain. It's called the Luistania War, and that goes from 155 BC to 133 BC. So you can see Rome is fighting these two wars, but on top of that, they will also fight their third and final Punic War down in Carthage. And this will start at 149 and goes to 146 BC. So you can see Rome is fighting these three wars throughout their conquered territories on opposite ends of their territory. And we're going to talk more about this obviously later, but this starts to run into Rome's uh, problem uh, with their government republic system is not capable of handling uh, the vast uh, territory that they have conquered. Their system is not working too well for it. But the Romans, as you know, are always adapting and changing. Now here we are in 155 BC and Punicus, he's a rebel commander in Lusitania area and he attacked some neighboring lands which belonged to the Romans. The Lusitanians had killed some 6,000 Roman uh, civilians basically including a quaestor named Varro. Uh, uh, the quaestor is a supervisor of the state treasury and auditor. Now Punicus, he's then killed during some of these skirmishings and he is uh, succeeded by Caesarus. Now at this time Rome sends Mummius, he's a general, to take over and he initially defeats Caesarus but while Caesarus was fleeing he turned things around and the Lusitanians ambushed Mummius and killed 9,000 Romans. Now Mummius then takes his remaining 5,000 men back to camp. Mummius then later attacks and kills a large number of Lithuanians and retake back, retakes back the city of Osile. Now, sorry, I'm going to butcher some of these names, but um, Mummius now goes back to Rome and he gets a triumph for, uh, you know, pushing the Lithuanians back into their tribal areas. Now Marcus Attilius, he comes over and he takes over and he continues to campaign and he captures the largest Lusitanian city, Oxythrace. This forces the rest of the tribes to make surrender terms in 152. So this first Lusitania war goes from like 155 to 152. Now there's no major engagements going on here, so we don't affect the Roman battle record. Now. They surrendered in the spring, or the truce was made, and in the same year of 152 winter, they start again. I do record this whole campaign as a loss for the Romans. And here's what happens. In the winter of 152, the, the Lusitanians again attack Roman settlements, and the Romans react swiftly. And after initial successes by the praetor Servus Galba, he is defeated, losing 7,000 Romans. He then retreats into Carmandia. The proconsul Lucius Licinius Lucullius, he moves out of Trutitania and he kills 4,000 Lusitanians at Gates. Now according to Appian, when Galba and Lucullus were combining the movements, the rebels once again sent offers of peace and Galba agreed to them. So the rebels came down out of the mountains and Galba had them separated into three groups and then slaughtered them. There were 7,000 in all. Now, the man we're interested in here, the leader, Virathus. Virathus was a great guerrilla leader and he never lost a battle to the Romans. Now, it is said he may have been one of these survivors though. Now, he wasn't the leader yet, but this is how he became their chosen leader. The rebels find themselves uh, being uh, cornered again and they were being hammered by Gaius Vitilius in the Trutitania area. 
Now, once again, the Lystutanians were forced to ask for peace. Now, Virathus steps up and he warns them of Galba's treachery, remember, four years before? And he said he had a plan. And at this point, the rest of the tribes elect him leader. So he becomes leader at this point. Now, what he told them to do as they come down to surrender, he told them to form up in a battle line. Then, when he mounted his horse, that was a signal for them to scatter, and they'll meet up at a designated point later, which is in Tribolia. Now, as his men were scattering, he had hand-picked 1,000 men to stay behind and cover the retreat. Now, Vitilius, he stayed and he gave battle to these 1,000 men, and he chose not to go after the scattering army. Now, for two days, Virathus moves his cavalry around the field, in and out. He feints retreat, and then he attacks. He confused the Romans, and then he left the field to go to Tribola. And the Romans then reformed and tried to follow. Now the Romans had a difficult time following them. They know the area too well. As the Romans were marching to Tribolia, all the forces of the Lystitanians ambushed the Romans, killing 4,000. The rest of the 10,000 man force ran to Carpatius. Now here they were either killed or captured while they were moving there. Now including Vitilius, and the Roman quester, he had fled to Gracia, where he called for help, and 5,000 Gallic allies came, and they were sent out, and they were skirmishing against the uh, Lystitanians, and they never returned. Now, the Romans remained inside their city of Gracia for the rest of the year while Virathus raided Roman settlements. So this victory of the Trutania campaign goes to Virathus. This is his first great victory against the Romans and there will be more to come. Because the next battle doesn't take place until 146 BC. So I'm kind of going to be going around, jumping around here. Now remember at this time the Fourth Macedonian War is also taking place from 150 to 146. But the Third and Final Punic War also starts in 149. So let's jump over to Carthage. Now, the third and final Punic War starts in 149. There was three major battles in this engagement. Now, Polybus writes that the Numidian king, Massinissa, he was raiding the Carthage territory here in Africa. And Carthage sent this matter to Rome. But the leading senator who wanted Carthage destroyed, Cato the Elder, there's Cato again popping up, he told the Senate that Carthage was prospering as big as ever and something needed to be done. Now, when Carthage sent an army against Messinissa because Rome did nothing, that was in violation of the treaty that Rome and Carthage had, so Rome sent an army to Africa. Now, in this, the Romans were done, remember, with their wars of defense. They wanted to control everything at this point because it was the only way they can keep their surrounding areas uh, under their administration and, and, you know, in their words, peace. So they were picking this fight from the start. Now, when the Roman army got there, they failed to take the city because it was a huge fortified city indeed. Now, Rome set up two camps. Hasdrubal, now this is not the same Hasdrubal the Barca brothers, but Hasdrubal, he would launch war parties and cut the supplies to these Roman camps and he was harassing them. Now, when the Romans would assault the city and fell, Hasdrubal would then send his army out to attack the Romans after the assault fell, killing many. So he was really doing a number on uh, the Romans. Now, if it were not for a young tribune, Scipio Emilianus, now, he is the grandson of Scipio Africanus. Now, Scipio, as you can tell by now, is a very... Uh, uh, aristocratic Roman name at this time. They're all over the uh, army and uh, high uh, official offices. Now this young tribune, if it wasn't for him holding back his men as the Romans were fruitlessly attacking uh, the city and he was protecting the Romans as they were retreating, a lot more Romans would have been killed. And the Roman army had owed their life to this tribune and they praised him for his heroic defense so they recognized 
uh, Scipio Melanus is skill right away. Now, this is the backdrop of what's happening in this third war. Nobody's getting anywhere. The Carthaginians are, sh are shut in, trying to maneuver a little bit outside, and the Romans are trying to take the city, and nothing's happening. Now, that brings us to our first major engagement, and it happens in 149, and it's the Battle of Nefarious. When new consul Manilius arrived, he ordered an immediate attack on the Carthaginian camp near Nefarious, and Scipio advised against this. Initially, things went well, but as the Romans advanced, the position became unattainable and had to withdraw, which then Hasdrubal attacked and again killing many. But Scipio Aemilianus's cavalry would hold back the Carthaginians long enough to allow the Romans to retreat. So once again, Scipio Aemilianus saves the Roman army from total disaster, but Manilius was defeated by uh, the Carthaginians. So the Romans have now lost a battle in the Lusitania War and they have now lost this first battle in the Punic, uh, Third Punic War. Now in 148 and new councils arrive. Remember new councils are picked every year and a lot of them are running and trying to be elected on the grounds that hey I will go defeat the enemy. I will go defeat Carthage. You know. So the new councils come over and they're almost forced to fight right away and get a quick victory otherwise they're going to look bad anyway so the senate in 147 they gave in to overwhelming demand that Aemilianus be made council even though he was too young to run but the army over there loved him everybody was recognized in his ability and so the senate had changed the laws and made him council now when Scipio is first in charge the first thing he does is he kicks out the soldiers who lacked discipline and who had low morale. So he got rid of that disease within the army. He then built a mole around the harbor to stop the supplies from getting into Carthage. So remember, a commander's job is always logistics and preparation. The men are going to do the fighting, and if they're trained well, they're going to fight the way they're supposed to fight. But it's really the commander's job in the preparation, and you can see it right here. He takes charge, and he starts doing things that the soldiers can recognize that are going to benefit them. And so the soldiers will fight for him, they're, uh, they're going to follow him, and they're going to trust him. So there's a next battle. It's the second battle of Nefarious, and Scipio constructs a brick structure as high as the walls of Carthage because Carthage was huge it was a very fortified city in one section he did this and he put 4,000 archers on it and he started firing into the Carthage ramparts from short range he then moved on the Carthage camp of Nefarious and assaulted the camp from all directions and, ran, and overran it and then he ran down the survivors with his Numenian allied cavalry and very few escaped. So now the Romans get their first win here at the Second Battle of Nefarious. Now we're at 146 BC. This is the third engagement in this uh, Third Punic War. And it's the Battle of Carthage. Now what do they do? What do the Senate do? You know, Senate does some smart things sometimes. And here they extend the consulship of Scipio. They recognized that this is what they needed and he was doing well. So they extended it for another year and this time Scipio launches a full-scale assault on the great city from the harbor area and he breached. After three years the Romans were finally in the city. For six days they systematically went through the streets until the city was completely taken. Out of probably they figure there was they really don't know the exact numbers at this time especially when Carthage lost its second uh, Punic War. A lot of people probably left, but they know there was oh, at least over 100,000 people, and some figures can say that there could have been up to words of 500,000 people there. But somewhere in between there, even if we say it's about 200,000 people, only 50,000 people survived. That's how ruthless the Romans sacked the city, and the survivors were sold into slavery. Then Carthage was raised to the ground. The Romans put salt over the area so nothing would ever grow there again. So this ends the great uh, city of Carthage. 
the third and final Carthage War, and it ends in 146. Roman uh, wins its second battle here, so they went two and one in this third Carthage War. Now remember, the Romans sack the city of Carthage in the same year over in uh, Greece. Remember, we already talked about, they sacked the city of Corinth and slaughtered the inhabitants. So the Romans are becoming sackers of cities, and we're gonna cover one more city that they sack. This takes us back to the Lusitania War. Now, remember they've already lost their first battle to Virithus. And this next battle is called the Battle the Heel of Venus. And it's in 146. Now Rome sent Caius Plutius and 10,000 men and 1,500 cavalry. Virithius stopped his campaigning that he was ransacking in the Carpentaria and withdrew into Lusitania. Plutius sent 4,000 troops after them which were routed. Then the two armies came together and met at the Hill of Venus, and the Romans were soundly defeated. Plutius went into winter quarters even though it was midsummer, and Varethius had free run of the country again and he was capturing many corn supplies from the Romans. Now Rome was alarmed enough to send a Roman consul. Now remember, any time a Roman consul was sent somewhere, they were sent with two legions and two auxiliary legions. So they now sent a pretty good force over there. And leading this was Maximus Emilianus, who was given command, and he ended up raising two more new armies of recruits because he was going to give the veterans of the Punic Wars and the Macedonian Wars a rest. So he was rec recruiting fresh troops here. Now this goes into our third major battle in the Lusitania War, and the Romans lose again their third in a row here. Maximus Emilianus, he camps at Orso, this is the Battle of Orso in 144 BC, to train his newly uh, recruited army. And there's some skirmishing going on that he has against the rebels, but no full-scale battles. However, he leaves the camp because he wanted to make sacrifices to give him victory. Because remember, back then, I mean, the Greeks, the Romans, they all uh, went to their temples and they would do sacrifices to give them good omens to win battles. Well, he did the same. And as he left, his legati was left in charge. Now, Varathius, he killed the Roman foragers that were outside their camp. So the legati came out of the camp to do battle. Emilianus returned to find his recruits were beaten in a fight. So there's their third loss. Now for the rest of the year in 144, uh, Virethus, he continued to tempt the Romans out of the camp. He wanted to bring these soldiers out so he could destroy them, but Emilianus would have none of it. He continued to drill his recruits inside and he would only send them out in skirmishing parties. This was to build up their resolve and their morale. Now, Emilianus, when he was ready to fight, the Senate had to continue his charge, so they extended his consulship, and he went on campaign, and he managed to push the Lusitanians out of the area and retake several of the Roman towns. Then he went into winter quarters. Now, the next spring, uh, the Lusitanians came back, and they even retook one of the towns, and they pushed the Romans back. The Romans went back into winter quarters again. Now, he was replaced next spring by Quintus Pompeius Aulius. And Pompeius Aulius, he campaigned with great success and he forced Virethius, who was low on provisions, to retreat back into Lusitania. Now, because the wars were fought around the New Mancia area, uh, the war is sometimes called, sort of at this point, uh, the Numitine War, because the Numitine tribes were involved. So. It's the Lusitania War or the Numantine War. Now the following year though, in 143, Virethius, he returns and he attacks Aulius at Utica and killed about a thousand Romans. Aulius then retreated to Cordoba and he wintered for the, you know, he went in for winter quarters there. And then the following year, 142, they have a second battle of Utica and Fabius Maximus Servilianus, he succeeds Aulius, and he encounters Viarathus, and he loses 3,000 legionnaires, and he retreats back to camp, but he manages to defense, defend his camp against Viarathus, and Viarathus was trying to take the camp, but he withdrew the next day because of the heat was so severe. 
So about a month later, the Battle of Lusitania takes place. Now Maximus, he did not follow Virathus into Lusitania, but instead he went toward key cities and he captured Escatadia, uh, Gemella, and Opacola. Now while marching, he was attacked by two of Virathus' commanders with 10,000 men, and he beat the guerrillas off. But he captured 500 of them, which he beheaded. Now, uh, Maximus also found that there were Romans among these rebels, obviously deserters. And so he had their hands cut off, so the Roman traitors wouldn't be able to fight against them. Now, all in all, on this expedition, Maximus had killed around 10,000 guerrillas. Now, remember, these two commanders that were attacking him and trying to ambush him, Virathus was not there, not involved. So the Romans get a win for the Battle of Lusitania, but Virathius does not get a loss. He does not lose this battle. He wasn't involved. Then Maximus Servilianus found Virathus in the town of Ursana. Virathus called in more troops during the night, which snuck into the town. Then the next day they sallied forth and forced the Romans who were digging entrenchments to retreat. Servilianus met Virathus in battle outside the city and was defeated, and the remnants ran and were cut off when they ran up to the edge of a cliff. Virathus thought at this time he would spare the Romans and Servilianus and hoped Rome would accept peace and respect his capabilities and leave the Lusitania territory a free province and a friend of Rome. The Senate ratified the agreement and it was glad to be clear from this war. And this was another loss for the Romans. Now, in 140, so a couple years later, Servilius Capeo, he was given the governorship of Spain. And for glory and booty, he tried for a year for the Senate to declare war on Lusitania. Rome finally did, and for a year he pursued Verathesis around Lusitania, but could not bring him to terms. The next year, Sextius Junius Brutus, he joined forces with Capeo, and Verathus was forced to accept peace on any terms. They finally had him cornered. Now, Virathus sent three close friends to parley with Capeo, but Capeo had bribed them with rewards and uh, promises of land if they were to kill Virathus. So they went back and they assassinated Virathus. They slit his throat in his sleep. Capeo then killed the traitor, saying Rome does not pay traitors. This action was looked down upon, though, by the Senate. Now Virathus, he was assassinated in 140, and for the next three years, the new rebel leader, Tatilus, he had fought three Roman councils, and he was beaten back them every time. Now in 137, the new council, Gaius Manicus, he was trying to take Numantia from the rebels, and he was felling at every attempt. But in 134, the new council, Scipio Emilius, remember, he's the grandson of Scipio Africanus, and he was the victor in the Third Cartridge War who sacked Carthage. He took over, and what's the first thing Scipio did? He improved the morale of the army by drilling, marching, and skirmishing. And when he felt the army was ready, he marched to Numantia, following a harder route just to avoid ambushes, and was attacked several times by the guerrillas, but he beat back the attacks. He marched at night and rested in the day to avoid the heat, and then he camped near Numantia. He built fortifications nine miles long around the city. He starved the city into surrender, and everybody was sold into slavery. All in all, it took a total of 15 months for Scipio to take Numantia after previous Roman councils had failed for the last five years. And Scipio Emilianus, he received the surname Numantius. The Lusitania War brought one of the greatest guerrilla fighters of all time. Virathrus was 6-0 versus the Romans, which is a great record versus the Romans. That was even better than Hannibal. Now Scipio Emilianus was given the surname Numantius. He was 3-0, but those three victories he had were major, major victories 
and he became known as the sacker of cities. Now, I want to talk a little bit about why Rome seemed to find themselves having to sack cities and slaughter the inhabitants here in the second century. In the year 146, two major cities were sacked, and in 133, another major city was sacked by the Romans. Because Rome's dependence upon her overseas power and the wealth she was getting from these overseas uh, adventures led to neglect of the old Italian self-sufficient economy. So they kind of neglected the Italian mainland because so much wealth and slaves and resources were, were pouring in from overseas and this produced way more wealth than the Italian, Italian peninsula was producing and this led Rome to be more of a predatory uh, exploiting uh, their neighbors. And I think this in itself led to pitiless sacks of cities rather than decisive battles which were then followed by peace terms because two armies that had honor and looked for honor and respected each other came together on the battlefield. The conclusion of that decisive battle determined who was going to be the victor. And during the third century, during the wars of defense, Rome was not interested in conquering and taking over all their neighbors. But as we've seen, because there was constant problems on their borders, Rome decided that it was in their best interest to become their own peacekeeping force on their outer borders. And therefore we moved into the wars of conquest. And this changed the attitude of both sides. The struggles of this later second century characteristically terminated in the pitiless sack of cities rather than decisive battles followed by peace terms where you know decisive battles two armies would meet it was sort of a uh, gesture of honor between which armies were better but at, at this point though it turned into Rome being aggressors and wanting to conquer their opponents and so for example the Achaean League and its ally Corinth revolted against the Roman settlement of Greece. The Corinthians, they treated the Roman senatorial ambassadors with disrespectful violence. And after the short war which followed, the Fourth Macedonian War, the Roman consul Lucius Mummius raised Corinth and enslaved its inhabitants. Now the same year, 146, remember, had seen the destruction of Carthage, bringing the third and last Punic War to its bitter end. The Carthaginians had recalled from exile an able general, another Hasdrubal, and he organized their solid defenses. A 45-foot city walls. The Romans made slow progress against this. The Roman besieging army itself at one time was in grave danger and was saved only by the energy and resources of Scipio Milianus. Remember I already talked about uh, Milianus. And when the Carthaginians were successful in running the Roman blockade by sea, Scipio built a mole across the gulf into which their harbor issued, thus cutting them off. The Carthaginians dug a canal from their inner harbor basin to the coast and put to sea with a full fleet, but the Romans defeated them in a naval engagement. The walls of Carthage were finally breached. Hasdrubal had surrendered and was reserved for the day when Scipio triumphed as a victorious general in Rome. But his wife and children preferred to perish in the flames with the rest of the Carthaginians. And we're going to continue seeing this in Roman history where uh, rebels will choose death and to be put to death rather than be taken captive by the Romans. And the Romans want to demolish and punish a city for trying to stand up to them. Another appalling siege was that of Numantia in 133. For Rome, the capture of Numantia marked the successful culmination of a savage and often shameful war, in which, after the elimination of Carthage, the Romans aimed to impose their rule on the native peoples of the Spanish peninsula. The siege operations at Numantia were, like those at Carthage, conducted by Scipio Emilianus. Now, here, Scipio was something 
of an expert in sieges. Appian says that he was the first general to enclose with a wall an enemy who was prepared to give battle in the open field. So here, Scipio would rather conduct a siege which, which was out often long, expensive, and bloody rather than just fight a decisive battle. And this has to do with what we'll look at later about the decline of the Roman Republic. Now, it might have been expected that such an enemy would prove impossible to contain, but Scipio's measures were very thorough. Numantia was beset with seven forts and surrounded by a ditch and palisade. The perimeter of the circumference was twice as long as that of the city. At the first sign of a sally by the defenders, the threatened Roman sector had orders to hoist a red flag by day or raise a fire signal by night, so that reinforcements could immediately be rushed to the danger spot. This sounds just like what Caesar was doing at Alicia. So the Romans learned this, and the generals, you know, later generals studied earlier generals' tactics. Now. Another ditch was then built behind the first, also with palisades, after which a wall 8 feet high and 10 feet wide was constructed. Towers were sited at 100 foot intervals along the wall, and where the wall could not be carried round the adjacent marshland, its place was taken by an earthwork of the same height, thicker than the wall. Now there was a river that ran through Demantia. And this enabled the defenders to be supplied by means of small boats, swimmers, even divers. And Scipio therefore placed a tower on either side of the river to which he moored a boom of floating timbers. And these timbers bristled with inset knives and spearheads and were kept in constant motion by the strength of the current. And they acted as a barrage, effectively isolating the city from any help which might reach it along the river catapults and all kinds of siege engines were now mounted on Scipio's towers and missiles were accumulated along the parpits, the forts being occupied by archers and slingers. Messengers were stationed at frequent intervals along the entire wall in order for the headquarters might be informed immediately of any enemy action, whether by day or by night. Now each tower was furnished with emergency signals and each was ready to send immediate help to another in case of need. Invested for eight months, Numantines starved. They took to cannibalism, and at least 4,000 surviving citizens, now mere filthy and ragged skeletons, surrendered unconditionally. So all in all, with the end of the Wars of Conquest, the Lusitania War, and the Third Punic War, we the Romans had won four of those battles and lost seven of them. So their battle record now goes to 42 and 22.